Before we start, we need to re review what these symbols mean. This means I form, you, he, she, it, we, y'all, they. The forward-looking head it means forward-looking or prospective into the f future. Backward-looking head is backward-looking or retrospective into the past. Also, the passive forms we know now. I am blanked, you are blanked, he, she, it is blanked, we are blanked, y'all are blanked, and they are blanked. All right, so in English and Latin, there are two different situations based on whether the main verb in the sentence is past tense or present tense. So the first situation is that the main verb is either present or future tense, like I hope that you or I will hope that you as our main verb. In Latin, this would be petebo ut or peto ut. Now, if that's the case, then the subjunctive verb will have be some form of shall, will, can, may. Either shall, will, can, may itself if it's forward looking, or shall, of, will, of, can, of, may have if it's backward looking. And this is the tense that we're going to get in chapter 32 right now. We use the green forward looking head for prospective to signify a forward looking subjunctive, and the orange one to signify a backward looking subjunctive. Notice how, as the main verb shifts from future to present, the cloud of subjunctive possibilities shift with it. So wherever that main verb goes, any given subjunctive in its cloud is relative to its time. All right, so this is called the relative time rule, that the subjunctive is only secondary, and its exact time on the timeline can only be determined after you determine the time of the main verb, which is primary. So the main verb determines where in time the subjunctive's verb can occur. Notice that as the main verb becomes closer and closer to the present, at times the shell of will of can of may have form here extends all the way back into the past. So even though this is a present or future tense main verb, the shell of action could have gone on back then. Now the second situation that can occur when you have a past tense main verb was covered back in chapter 29 and we'll also cover the left half of it in chapter 33, but it's not relevant to today, so I'm going to skip that. Again, notice how each of the tenses is translated. So what we're going to learn in future slides of this video is that in the perfect tense, if we're backward looking and talking about a reality in the past, then we're going to use the perfect stem here in orange. This is our new tense in chapter 32. And notice this one should look very familiar to you if you've learned the future perfect already, but if you haven't, then you'll get that in chapter 30. We're going to take the perfect stem and add on a form of the future tense of soon. And I made it blue here so that you would remember, oh yeah, it's future future tense. And the way these two combine is that the perfect stem in orange gives us the have blanked, in other words the VE and ED, and the future tense in blue gives us the may. So here's what they all look like. Okay, so let's talk a moment about what you should hear in your ear and then think when you hear each of these subjunctive words. If you hear something that sounds like an infinitive, like wokare, that signifies abstract reality. Abstract is something that is otherworldly, theoretical, divorced from reality, has no flesh and bones on it, but it's just like an idea. That's abstract. The infinitive is an abstract action treated as a noun. You're concretizing it and viewing it as a noun abstractly, like calling itself, the act of calling itself. And so it's natural when we hear an infinitive in our ear that we should naturally think, oh, should, would, could, might, because should, would, could, might is also an abstract theoretical reality. So infinitives, like the action of calling, naturally are conducive to this idea of shouldness, wouldness, couldness, or mightness. However, if we hear some form of future, like 
this E or A, which is very similar to your third and fourth conjugation A and E rule, if you forgot that, like DCOM, DCASE, DCAT, or this ERIM, which is similar to ERO, ERIS, ERIT, the form of the verb to be in, the, in its future tense, then that is not abstract. That more suggests possibility and freedom and potentiality. Why does it do this? Well, the reason it does it is because in Wolken, by changing that vowel to its opposite of what you would expect, it gives this idea of freedom that, hey, I can break the rules, or I'm being different and unique. And that difference and unique should and make you realize that, oh, this is a subjunctive verb, a, a possibility, a hypothetical thing that might happen, not something that certainly will happen. The wokal worm doesn't signify freedom quite as much. That's just because this tense is so close to the future perfect that it really kind of gets swallowed up and absorbed by the future perfect and is hardly even a subjunctive tense. Now that we have four tenses of the subjunctive, how do you decide which one you should use? What's the actual thought process to make that decision? Well, there are two different situations that we covered in previous slides, and notice that. In each of these situations, we could have to use a present stem or a perfect stem. Notice that. So there's no quick, easy solution to rule out certain possibilities. Well, remember, the first decision is up here in the top row. Is my main, main verb a present or be later than that tense, or is my main verb a past tense? So based on that, you'll either go to the left with past tense or to the right with present or future. After that, once you've noticed what your main verb is, then you'll pick from one of the two possibilities. On the right here, if you've got a present main verb, then it will be wokawarim or wokem, depending if you want to be looking to the future or to the past. Over here on the left, you'll pick from one of these two verbs, wokarim or wokawisim. And you can see that you can use any of the four subjunctive words, whichever one you, pl you please. Should, would, might, could, it doesn't matter. This brings in the second way, the second and easier way to think about it. You think to yourself, okay, does it feel past-ish or does it feel present future-ish? Once you decide that, then you say ut, which means so that. And then you just have to know by experience what two subjunctives go with the past main verb and which one of them is the apostrophe ve one and which two subjunctives go with the present future-ish main verb, and which one is the apostrophe V, E one. Obviously, the perfect stem ones are the apostrophe V, E ones, but you have to actually just know them and be able to rattle them off. And you can think about it in English like this. I blanked so that I might blank or might have blanked. And then in the right side, I blank so that I may blank or may have blanked. blanked. All right, try to answer these questions. As you answer these, pay particular attention to what tense the main verb is in, because that will tell you which of the two situations you're in. All right, so stop the video and then you can start it to see the answers. All right, there they are. And then attempt these as well, which are very similar. Notice too that ne down here is just the negative form of ut. So if ut is so that, ne then would be so that not. Or our English way of saying that is lest. All right, so now you have a good grasp of the concept of the subjunctive. Now we just need to get really good at writing these subjunctives, and that's what we're going to do in this next part of the video. The third subjunctive tense is the present past-looking or retrospective subjunctive. So this is going to be when you have a present or future main verb, but it is talking about something that happened previously to that. And it could be any time previously. Remember, the role of relative time means that if the main verb is present, then it will have to be in the past. But if the main verb is future, then that subjunctive verb could be still slightly in the future and not yet into the past. Or it could be even right now. So, 
This is going to be a really boring, hardly ever used tense. It is practically identical to the future perfect tense, which you learned in stage 30. This tense is the same as that tense in stage 30, except this one is just more broad in general. So if you learn the general situation here, you'll have no problem applying it to the specific case up then in the future, several chapters from now. Okay, so let's take a look at the similarities between this new subjunctive on the right and that future perfect that we're going to learn in stage 30 on the left. They're identical practically. The only difference is ero becomes erim in the subjunctive, in the more general subjunctive. Okay, everything else is the same. So, and the way you translate these are I will have called, whereas this one is I will have called or I shall, can, or may have called as well. So these, this has four possible will, shall, can, may, and this one only has one possible word, will. So what's the difference? There really isn't one. All right, so how did this present backward-looking subjunctive occur? Well, it really was the future perfect to begin with, and what happens is that the future perfect occurs in a very limited situation with the future. If you will have blanked, then something will blank. And if that is broken in any way, like the main verb suddenly no longer becomes future, but instead becomes present, then what's going to happen is that the other verb, the future perfect, suddenly just now becomes called the present backward-looking subjunctive or the term that most people like, they call it the perfect subjunctive, which I think is so badly described because perfect is the word for the past. And this is really something having to do with looking forward to the future. So I don't like the name perfect because it just conveys looking in the wrong direction. Okay, but in, that's why I changed the name of this tense to the present backward-looking subjunctive. Remember also this tense here is to remind you that it's not just present. It could be also a future main verb. So the, it really I could call it the present or future backward-looking subjunctive, but I didn't, didn't want to say all that. So I just say the present plus to distinguish it from past subjunctives. So if the main verb stays future or at least present, then the new subjunctive will have nearly the same identical Latin spelling as we saw on the previous slide but it will now be called the present backward-looking or by the old system perfect subjunctive rather than the future perfect indicative. All right, blah, blah, blah. I can see that they may have caulked the boat by now. May have, as opposed to what it used to be. If you will have caulked the boat, then we will sail. Now as I can see that they may have caulked the boat by now. Therefore, let's take a chance and sail. All right. <laughs> All righty. So um, the form of this is I may have called, you may have called, she may have called, we may have called, you all may have called, they may have called. Now, that was easy. This is hard. Harder. Okay, so the passives then are not going to be nearly so easy as they were in the previous two subjunctive tenses that you just learned. Okay, so we need to take as our model the future perfect. And however that makes its passive is probably how we're going to make our passive of the present backward-looking subjunctive. So, um, wokawaro was one of the perfect stem tenses, as you see the three of them here. And the way these all make their passive is when they're active, they take the third principal part, minus the I. Um, but if they're passive, then they take the, instead, fourth principal part. So the way you'd make passive, then, of all of these is not wokav, the, the perfect stem, but wokatus ero. So here's the passives of each of these tenses. Called I will be, called I am, called I was being, or more colloquially, I will have been called, I was called, I had been called. However, notice that these are two separate words. 
This term here, the fourth principal part, is called a participle. It is a adjective called. I am called. But it has, as you can hear, it has verbal content inside of it. And that idea of an adjective with verbal content inside of it is what a participle is. And so this wokatus is what we're going to use to make the passive of wokawarim, just like in chapter 30 we make the passive of wokawaro. Okay, so wokawaro and wokatus ero are future perfect, but to make it present backward looking subjunctive, we're going to just change that o to im. Now, it's not perfect because you would have thought that this would be wokatus erim, but instead it's going to become sim, which is the flimsy subjunctive form of sum here, which I blot blotted out so that you wouldn't think of sim and sum as being different tenses on the timeline. Really, sum is present, and sim is potentially present, because a subjunctive is just a hazy cloud that could be anywhere, present or future or past, depending on when his main verb is. So sim is just the subjunctive form of sum. And you're going to have to start, you get used to sticking on the sim instead of what you would have expected, erim. Okay, so although the future pre perfect and present subjunctive are nearly identical in their active voice, as we saw on the previous slide, yet in their passive voice they have a different form of the verb to be. The future perfect has ero, I will be, but the subjunctive uses sim, I may be, the flimsy sim. Uh. So this is the way you'll make each of these tenses. Take, stop the video, take a good hard look at it, and get familiar with these forms. Now notice it's flipping here between singular and plural. And of course blue is masculine, pink is feminine, and gray is neuter. And you can put any one of these endings with any one of those. So a girl would say, well, kata sim, for instance. I may have been called. And several girls would say, well, kata simus, we may have been called. So will have been called and may have been called. And we're more interested in the one on the left. So get used to it. You're going to have to make these. All right, so the future perfect, let's just go with the model first. In its active, it becomes wokav plus ero. In its passive, it becomes wokatus plus ero, even though they are now in two, in two separate words. Wokatus ero, wokatus eris, wokatus erit, wokatierimus, wokatieritis, and wokatierint. And let's include the other two genders, just so we are not discriminatory. And the translation of that's going to be will have been blanked, occurring sometime before the future. Whereas this here is the present backward looking subjunctive. And this too is going to take wokawa rim, but then when it goes into passive, it's going to become sim instead. So wokata sim, I may have been called. Wokata sis, you may have been called. Wokata sit, he may have been called. Wokati simus. Wokatisitis and Wokatisint, they may have been called. And did you notice, I hope that the stem changed halfway through all that when we switched into plural. I hope you did. And these are the other two genders, just to be non-discriminatory. And the translation is may have been called. More general and amorphous and fuzzy. All right, so, so stop the video and attempt these questions. Also check and see if there's more questions on the next slide. Okay, so I hope you got all these questions right. Notice in number four that a deponent is a passive form but an active meaning. So even though it has an active meaning, have promised, yet we use a passive looking form, polycatus sim. Of course, you already knew this about deponents. It's nothing new. All right, so bringing it all together. So we have our four subjunctive tenses. We've got active on the top and passive on the bottom. And so the actives, again, were Ben read a diary and wokav erim and then wokarim and wokawisim and then down in the passives, it will be be blanked of whatever was in the active. So 
may have called becomes may have been called, and would call becomes would be called. And the ways you make these are in the present forward looking. You just tack on the aris tur mermini inter endings. Same over here in the third one, the past forward looking, just aris tur mermini inter endings. But to make the passive of the other two, you need, since it's a perfect stem tense, you need to use the participle to make the passive. And so one will get sim, and the other we won't have until chapter 33. So sim was the subjunctive of sum, maybe, and the other in chapter 33. You might think of sim as a subjunctive of sum, and it is, but it's bigger than that. So, because it could also include future. It's kind of the subjunctive also of ero. And most teachers will tell you that. They will say, oh, this is the perfect subjunctive. And so it is the subjunctive of the perfect indicative, which was phooey. But the answer you should say to them is, well, if that's the case, then find me one sentence in which a perfect indicative main verb takes a perfect subjunctive. And of course, they'll immediately admit that this is impossible because relative time rules require that a perfect indicative should take either an imperfect or pluperfect subjunctive, but never a perfect subjunctive, which all of course shows that what they're calling here the perfect subjunctive is not the perfect subjunctive because if, if, if it were, then you would see easy transitions between perfect indicative and perfect subjunctive but you don't. You can also say, oh, but fui meant something happening in the past, whereas fuerim could mean something happening in the present or future. So how are those two the same? Or fui is translated half blanked, whereas fuerim is translated will ha have blanked. So how are will or shall or may futurishly have blanked? So how are those two the same? That's just if you want to do your little part to change the old way of doing things to a new, more proper way of thinking about these. There really is no comparison between the four subjunctive tenses and the six indicative tenses. The six indicative tenses are rigid, are at certain points on the timeline, and the four subjunctive tenses are at certain other points on the timeline, and they move, whereas the six indicatives don't really move. Okay. All righty. So bringing it all together, hopefully this slide should make a lot more sense to you now. May call. May have called. Might call or would call. Put them all together and they look like a mess, but we can organize them a little more nicely. Notice that each one has a come in and then a go out, and a come in and a go out. And then in the passives, may be called, may have been called, might be called or would be called, Put them together and they make a mess, but they can be organized. And notice that the orange spheres have orange stems and the green spheres have green stems. So get these things straight in your mind. All right, and then the last thing in this part of the video is irregular verbs, the verb to be and the verb to go. And these do not have a passive, because you can't say, I was bead, or I was gone. No, no, no. So they only have active. And we have the principal parts of go down at the bottom here now. In our four tenses, these are going to follow the expected patterns, except in the present forward-looking subjunctive. So there... Sum becomes sim, and eo is it imus it is eunt becomes eam, eas, eat, eamus, eatus, eant. We shall go. And these two are irregular, just in this subjunctive tense only. The others follow the rules. Perfect stem plus form of erim. 
present infinitive plus ending. So, tense review. Where in the timeline do each of these occur? So hopefully you can do these now. If you don't want me to tell you, then press M on your keyboard to mute it so you don't hear what I say. But the way it is is present backward looking, present forward looking, past forward looking, present forward looking, present forward looking, past forward looking, present backward looking, past forward looking, present backward looking, present forward looking, Oh yes, and this is a form of the verb to want. Wolo, I want, becomes wellim. I may well shall can want. It's a nicer way to say it than just to say, I want it. Wellem is I would want, I might want. It's a nicer way to say it. I w Present backward looking. Present backward looking, I might, may have want, may have gone. Present forward looking, uh, past forward looking, and that's them all. So see if you can do it now without colors. Good luck. Stop the video and start it again when you want to see the answers. All right, this is the third and final part of the subjunctives video, and in this we're going to bring it all together and figure out exactly how to use subjunctives in sentences. And there are about seven or eight different kinds of subjunctive clauses, which will take a subjunctive. The ones down here now, below the line, have both kinds of subjunctives in them. So they're much more complex and difficult. Um, num is kind of like if. Num dot 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 on means whether or. But it's not usually used in conditional sentences so much. That's used more in the next big kind of clause, which is indirect questions. Now, indirect questions usually use any of your six famous interrogatives, who, what, where, when, why, how, or any form of those, like where from, or where to, or feminine, for instance, or whose, or to whom, dative. So, any of these indirect question. I'm going to skip relative clause of characteristic just because it's so rare that you can look it up yourself in a grammar somewhere if you really care, but it's pretty rare. It's just like such a person as would do blank. That's what the relative clause of characteristic is. And it's all, it too is introduced by these qui qui quad relative pronouns. Okay, so for this next clause, I want to go through a little demonstration here so that you will get the hang of what the difference is between a direct question and an indirect question. Okay, so this is a direct question like, ubi sumus, where are we? Now you can make it an indirect question by having someone report that question. I don't know where we may be. And you see we have made it into a subjunctive by changing the sumus to its subjunctive form, simus, more flimsy. So that's the way that indirect questions are in Latin you have to put the reported question into the subjunctive. I don't know where we may be. Ubi sumus? Nescio ubi simus. Then you can even make that into an indirect question, because I don't know where we are could become, why don't you know where we are? Cur nescis ubi simus. And that direct question, let's make that into an indirect question. Now, how are we going to do that? Which word are we going to make subjunctive to make this, why don't you know where we are, into an indirect question? Obviously, the overriding verb. We're going to make that subjunctive. I don't know why I may not know where we may be. I just don't got a clue. Okay. <laughs> so you can see here that we have an indirect question, ubi simus, inside of another indirect question. Cur nesciam, why may I not know? So 
course, that indirect question is being reported by the nescio. So anytime you have a main verb reporting something, and the thing reported is a question, that's going to go into the subjunctive, and it's going to be called an indirect question. All righty. So that's what we have in this. Of course, notice up top here the conjunctions, which will introduce an indirect question. Who, where, when, why, how, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so where are we? Main verb is present, ubi sumus. Now to make it into an indirect question, what do we need to do? We need to report it, so we need to bump another verb up in front of it. I don't know. Now the not knowing is being bumped up in front of it. Nescio ubi simus. See how that works? Direct question, indirect question. I don't know from where we may have come. Unde venerimus. I don't know where to we may go. Quo amus. All these are subjunctives. But notice one of them is a backward-looking one. So a reported indirect question can be about something at any point in time. Now what if we made it past tense? I didn't know. Well, we'd have to make our main verb nescio into a past tense, wouldn't we? Nesciebam. And now let's do all these three questions again, this time with a past tense main verb. First one, maybe becomes might be. Ubi esemus, from where we may have come becomes might have come. Unde venisemus, and where to we may go becomes might go. Quo iremus. So now you've got all four of your kinds of subjunctives demonstrated here. Present forward looking, present backward looking, past forward looking, and past backward looking. So indirect question is very versatile. All these are indirect questions. So turn the following direct questions in the parentheses into indirect questions. I was not knowing why we would win. Make the we would win into a subjunctive so that this will be an indirect question. And I gave you over here on the right the verb that you will use. So, how do you do this? Well, remember, you always start with the main verb, because the subjunctive's time will be relative to that. And now, is this main verb past, or is it present plus? Obviously, it's past, with the ba. So, you immediately know that winko is going to be one of the two past subjunctives. And the dead giveaway here is would. Would is forward-looking, whereas would have would be backward-looking. So, the way you make your past forward-looking subjunctive, remember, is Second principal part plus an ending. Winkeremus. All right, so stop the video and attempt all these on this slide, and then start it again when you're ready to move on. All right, so that's it. So good luck and enjoy it, and start reading these subjunctive clauses like an expert. Walete.